Hey everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Hope you're having a good time. Hope you had a great 4th of July. I know I did. Uh, so I'm doing something a little different this week. I have been traveling basically nonstop for the last two weeks for my own personal work that I do, videography, and then for my job, which is also videography and podcasting. Uh, I literally have not been home and a couple of podcast opportunities I had kind of fell through the scheduling and stuff. So I remembered that I had this presentation that Chester, who was just on two weeks ago, had given at the Hunt Fish podcast conference that I recorded for them with my friend Seth Geib. And uh, it was a really moving presentation. It was a, more of a speech. Uh, and it talks about his journey in the outdoors. And he has some really great points that I think you guys could benefit from. So I'm gonna put that out there because I'm not a huge fan of excuses. If I'm putting a podcast out weekly, it's coming out weekly. So I'm going to relieve you with that. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed this presentation. I told Chester and it was done that it was one of the best presentations I've ever heard. You know, hands down, I hear a lot of people talk. So I hope you guys get something out of it. It's truly a heartfelt thing. So I hope you enjoy. And I'll be back next week with another episode. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. Well, uh, first off, just if you don't know me, of course, I think everyone in the room does at this point. I'm Chester. And uh, I just want to honor Derek for having the vision for this event. I mean, it's, it's pretty dang incredible. And I want to thank you for giving a platform from people at all levels of this industry to come together and to be friends and to promote what we love. So thank you, man. It's just absolutely incredible. And the dudes that are cooking back there. Yes, my bandana's off to you, man. Uh, when I found out we had a Louisiana guy back there, I felt good. I'm like, okay, we're gonna have some good stuff here. We got some boudin, some jambalaya, some crawfish, and it was a lot of fun. But this is really uh, an honor and privilege to be here. And if I were to think, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about what all this is about. At the end of the day, it's about memories. It's really about memories, creating memories looking back at memories. There's not a person here that loves the great outdoors that doesn't have something, no matter where you start, if you started at five or 50, there's a memory. There's something that's a fuel, that's an impetus for everything you do. There's that moment or maybe a collection of moments that you think back, man, this is, this is where it all started. And uh, my most precious memories that, that I think back to when I'm being very grateful what happening are contained in the scrapbook. So my favorite memories when I was a kid for the outdoors were sitting in my dad's lap, dreaming big about doing great things in the outdoors. And we were in a lower middle income house in Orange, Texas when the oil industry busted in the early 1980s. And didn't have a whole lot of money, but been sitting on a bucket on the side of the road and getting dead shrimp and going fishing for whatever, or throwing our cast net to catch alligator darkfish and watching the free channels we had on TV, right? So I got to spend time with that. And I would save up my money, my change, you know, from just different stuff. And I would even do like little, uh, we would sell a little like, snow cone kit. We bought it like the Kmart store and I would sell snow cones. And we, I, one of the things I would do is I would go buy outdoors magazines. The local thrift store had them for a nickel a piece magazines. About once every couple of months, I would go clear them out of every sports and field, field and stream out their life, saltwater sportsman, everything that had a deer or a trout or a sailfish or something on the cover, I bought. And what me and my dad would do, we would sit together and dream big and cut out pictures of the things we wanted to see, the wildlife we wanted to see, the animals we wanted to hunt, the fishing we wanted to do, and we would put them in a scrapbook. I had about four or five of these and I thought they were lost forever. And uh, three years ago, anybody have a rough time the last few years or something? Anybody have some, some challenges in life, families? 
Well, I was kind of in a rough spot in terms of things like that going on in my family right about the time COVID was gonna become, right before it became a thing. And in 2019, I was praying one day and the Lord impressed the words higher calling in my spirit. And I prayed about it. And I knew that it was obviously to pray more, fast more, seek God. But also, I really believe the Lord was wanting me to go back to the things that made me want to work in the outdoors world. Like, so I'm an outdoors businessman. So I'm a writer, a photographer, podcaster, radio host, lecturer, doing all that stuff so I can make a living. But I, if you want me to write about redfish, I'm gonna have a story about redfish. You wanna sponsor a podcast about elk hunting, I'm doing a podcast about elk hunting, because I like it all. But I really believe the Lord wanted me to return to what I would have done for free. Like what the ultimate pinnacle was. And that was wild sheep, wild turkeys, mountain and forest wildlife, stream fisheries. So in 2019, I said, you know what? The extra time, ha ha ha, that I have, uh, I'm gonna push toward getting involved in those things. And it's really interesting how the Lord works because about two weeks later, I'm at my mom's house looking for something for her in the storage shed. And I found, I saw this for the first time in like 30 years. And I opened it up. And of course, we got a moose on the very front page. But this thing was loaded with, there's a Ureal. It was loaded with bighorns and turkeys. And I mean, literally this thing is loaded with sheep. I mean, there's like turkeys everywhere. And those were the things that I wanted to go see and I wanted to go pursue as a little boy sitting in my dad's lap and all turkeys. I had written about turkeys. I had hunted turkeys. I had written about sheep. But I thought, you know what? There's a reason that I have some level of talent to do this. So I need to use it for these things. I need, I need to take some portion of that time and project it out there for that. So this whole higher calling wildlife thing and my blog and all that was sort of was sort of born out of that. But I think about that time with my dad. Then my dad had the opposite childhood of me. He didn't know if his mom and dad loved him until the day they died. He wasn't a perfect man and I didn't live in a perfect family, but I never doubt that my mom and dad, my mom still here, love me. A lot of people don't have that. And so I treasure those times, sitting there dreaming big. But what was the moment, you know, I talked about it was a dark period, it began with my dad dying. Now, I've got to do some pretty freaking amazing stuff in my career. I've like, really been blessed, you know? We talked about some of the other day, like fishing in Venezuela, Segre River in Spain, catching Wells catfish, and all kind of waterfowl stuff and all that. But you know what my favorite thing I ever got to do because of who I am in the business? Take my dad a place he never could have afforded to go. I got to take my dad on some friends' cull deer hunts. If you know anything about cull hunts in Texas and some of these ranches, it's like mutant sized cold deer. I don't like the way that antler grows off. Okay, I'll sign up to kill it, you know? So my dad got to go on several of these and he killed a big buck with three main beams that will probably score 150. And I saw my dad, at this point, my dad was like 68. And I saw my dad with a smile on his face like I've never seen him. My dad was a little boy and it was such a cool night. Went back two years later to the same ranch. My dad ends up killing. So the thing was this rancher had a seven pointer he didn't like. So I didn't shoot that even. I hear a shot where dad's fan was. They come up with the, uh, the ranger there and there's this beautiful eight pointer on the front of the ranger. And I'm like, I thought he wanted you to shoot. Who shot the eight pointer? He goes, me. Because I counted antlers for 30 minutes from 200 yards away. <laughs> and the rancher like, it's cool, no problem. It was gonna be a cold there anyway. But I'm like, we get back to the lodge that night. And I'm like, so how upset are you? you accidentally shot the eight pointer? He goes, not that much, you know? <laughs> and the next night, me and my dad went out hunting and um, they, the rancher told my dad, you know, if you see any javelina, kill them all. And uh, my dad goes out there in a stand, sees a javelina. He puts a scope on it. He goes, I don't want to kill a javelina. He took a camera, he took pictures. 
was gonna take a picture and they all ran off. He's like, great, let's take a picture of my son and the kids he works with, see some cool javelinas and then a lone javelina walked out and stood right there and he got a picture. So that night we decided we're leaving the next morning, we take the deer out of the cooler and we had this conversation about how God had blessed him and, and all this and he shows me this picture of this javelina. I'm like, that's really cool, Dad. We go out to clean the deer and my dad fell dead from a massive heart attack right there on the side. Seven and a half hours from home, 9.30 at night, my dad on the hunting trip. They wanted me to stay. I'm like, I'm not staying. I'm driving home. I can't leave my mom and everybody alone. So I take this drive home and uh, I said, Lord, I know, I know he's with you, but I need something that knows I'm going to make it through this. <laughs> Pull off the gate and there's a lone javelina standing in the highway right in front of me. And I knew at that moment that was going to be okay. But hunting and fishing became a little bit dimmer for a while, I'll be honest with you, because my favorite partner was gone. And then, I, and then something happened and clicked inside of me when I heard the words, higher calm. And I started getting deeper in, involved in you know, trying to photograph wild sheep and wild turkeys and do all this cool stuff. And it was a lot of fun. I felt reinvigorated. And then we had this little thing called a pandemic. And it got crazy out there for all of us, right? But I had this sense of hope instilled that I hadn't had in a whole long time in my life. And it was in something that I loved. I almost quit hunting. I came this close to quitting hunting. Not because I was against hunting, because it didn't feel the same. I even had it planned to take my dad's favorite deer roughly called the Deer Slayer and go bury it where he died on the ranch. But you know what? I'm like, no. My dad would definitely want me to keep hunting. So this whole thing began and I started looking at things slightly differently. I've been involved in ministry. Me and my wife have a ministry. And our mission is to bring the redeeming love of Jesus Christ to hurting children through wildlife encounters. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Through a zoological facility, through a program where we get wishes to kids who've lost a, a parent or sibling or have a terminal illness. We just granted our 152nd wish, which was really cool. But one thing that I, I, I realized about all this is there's something about being out there on that pond in those woods, on that mountain, in the marsh, that brings healing, right? And the reason I want to bring you this message tonight is because I think what Derek brought together here, and I think what we're all a part of in the kindred spirits we have, I mean, I think it's a powerful thing. And I think there's a, there's a voice that's speaking out here for this outdoors thing that's crying out. And I think it's very, very important because there are a lot of people who don't have that chance. And you know the highest suicide rate in America is veterans. You know what the second highest is? 11, 14 year olds. We just did one of our wish encounters for a little girl who tried to kill herself and she was in seventh grade, ended up in Texas Children's Hospital. A week later did another one for a kid from the same school. But you know what? Everyone in this room has power to make, be a change agent for people through the great outdoors because there's healing in these places. Look, I mean, five years old, sitting in my dad's lap dreaming. And I remember, I remember seeing the picture that made me fall in love with wild sheep. It's right here. It's the exact picture. It's, it's literally, it's this guy with a big Rocky Mountain bighorn he killed with a bow. He had, I was like, man, that's a cool looking ram. You kill it with a bow, holy smokes. Maybe one day. And the first time I got to photograph a bighorn, believe it or not, it was three years ago, three and a half years ago, I thought about that picture. So what is this saying? Images, words, uh, media has power. It has power to draw people in and inspire people and help them take out of dark places. And it has a power to keep the wildlife that we love around. I had a great conversation with my friend Gray today about wild sheep. And I was like, man, this is so cool talking about this and the process of putting and keeping sheep on a mountain. And there's a lot that goes into that. You think of groups like CCA restoring redfish and Ducks Unlimited conserving wetlands. You know what it takes to do that? It takes people. Some of them have the bankroll, but some of them have talent they can give. Some of them have time they can give. Everyone can have a role. Everyone 
who loves wildlife and supports what we call this North American model, whether they know what that means or not, but they understand that this conservation ethic born out of, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and Aldo Leopold and all these great people of the past coming together and we get to put this on podcast. Someone out there may be listening to your podcast and go, someone else likes that animal that I'm obsessed with like me. Maybe I'm not crazy, right? And then there's the other option of this, of just the power of us being able to take other people. I mean, you don't know who's going home to do this. But just look at him in the eye and say, hey neighbor, maybe that, maybe that retired guy lost his wife in COVID. Hey man, you like to fish? Hadn't fished in a long time, I used to like it. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna buy your fishing license and I'm gonna start taking you fishing. That has power. That has power because you're giving, you're recognizing people and you're getting them out there. Because let me tell you something, I travel this country and the apocalypse of habitat loss we're facing is scary. The population bomb of humans has went off and we have to have people who are like-minded. They're gonna put some skin in the game. They're gonna join the National Wild Turkey Federation and the Wild Sheep Foundation and CCA and the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust and all these groups. We need voices and we need people and we all have the power to do it simply by being a friend and tell them to come out with us. You know, it's amazing to me the, the, the people I've connected with by simply loving wildlife. Like, it's amazing. And the way that you can, you, can, you can really impact someone's life by simply letting them see an animal. Maybe they don't wanna hunt, they wanna to come to the Warren Ranch and eat dinner and look and there's white-tailed deer out there. That's pretty dang cool. I never get tired of that. If I get tired, I need to quit, right? That is epic, right? We get to see this stuff, but most people, because what happens is, and when, when I did the uh, radio show with Heroes in the Water Day, which was really cool, um, we talked about how when people have a, 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 a trauma, or something happens, that it's like there's a cap on it. Like that moment in their mind, nothing will ever get better when I got that news, when that happened. And they think everything good's back here and they're worried about that happening again. But when Andrew Austin might take him herping and go find a canebrake rattlesnake, they might think, you know what? Life can be good again because someone invested in me and how to do that. When someone goes to coastal brigades or Bob White brigades or all of those things, oh my God, there's, there's sunshine, there's light, there's great things. And, and it's not a complex thing. It's just an investment of time and love. So we had our silver bullets last night. And don't worry, I'm not gonna make you give one, right? I'm not gonna make you do that. Uh, my wildlife one is, in wildness is the preservation of the world, Henry David Thoreau. But my life one is given it will be given unto you, Jesus Christ. And um, that's, that's, a, that's a powerful message because it'll come back. And, you know, I really think in terms of this podcast summit, the conservation groups represented here, the guides, everyone, the, the nonprofits, all these things is at creating new memories. To not just always look back, but to look ahead with hope that good days are ahead. I'm a, I'm a freaking pit bull. Like I'm going to grab onto whatever I have in life. And I don't know always how to do it, but I can hold on pretty good. I mean, and I'm a man of faith and I have days where I hang my freaking head and go, what's going on? So I know there are a lot of other people, especially young people who have a real challenge, right? We can be a voice for lifting, just simply putting out great content and sharing that with people and then sharing at the personal level. And I'm very inspired being here. I mean, come on, the Gale, the Gale Force twins, really? I mean, I mean, how awesome is what they're doing? This is not the next generation. This is the now generation right here in front of us. When I look in Andrew Austin's eyes, I see greatness for wildlife right there sitting in that seat. When I look in my new friend, Brittany Perry's eyes, I see greatness right there they're doing great things. And that inspires me. Now, I'm not the guy that's 48 years old and go, well, you know, it's your turn. You're gonna have to freaking take it from me. Like, I'm gonna keep moving. You're gonna have to outdo me. You're gonna have to wear me out. I ain't going nowhere. So, but here's the thing, we all go together. 
There'll never be unity in our culture. Are you freaking kidding me? We can have unity in this room. And then we can take it out to our other our friends. There's a lot of problems facing wildlife out there. I mean, holy smokes. It's terrifying. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart to go to a state one year and see this beautiful area where I saw elk and then there's a subdivision. Can't be a hypocrite. I live in a subdivision. But we got to find ways and voices to cry out for that. And I want to challenge you with this. Don't always look for the obvious when you look for people. Hey, we'll take anybody who wants some skin in the game, right? All of us will. But I think some of the ones who can be the greatest voice are the ones that nobody wants. No one would have picked 19-year-old Chester to do what I'm doing. Nobody. The long-haired kid in the metal band? To be an outdoor writer? To be a wildlife journalist? Are you kidding me? Well, naysayers, 30 years later, I freaking won, right? Like, the guy was on my side and I worked, but here's what I'm saying is, there are diamonds out there in the rough, right? And here's what we gotta do. We gotta start looking for them. We gotta start looking. I'll never forget being at a writer's event this guy comes up trying to sell me on, um, me and Paul had this discussion how metalheads are very cynical and like, screw you, I'm not dealing with this. And this guy comes up and goes, I had this great idea. I want to do a hunting and fishing camp only for rich kids. And I go, excuse me? And his idea was they're going to be the senators and they're going to be the politicians. I said, I don't care what kid goes to the camp. I want them all to have a great time and learn. Why only them? Well, I said, I think it's because you want big check, right? You know, and no, uh, no, no. I want rich kids to go to camp. My God, we need influential people. But we still live in America and it's screwed up, but it's still America. And there are people, they hadn't completely robbed us of the bootstraps yet. They're coming close. We can still pull ourselves up by the bootstrap. And there are still people who live in abject poverty who can be the president. So we need to look at everybody and find those people because what I found in our ministry, and I'll end with this, is that the ones who hurt the most, the ones overlooked the most, want something to sink their teeth into. They want a cause. And when you give it to them, they get it like that. That's what we've seen. I'll tell you a story about Madison. I will not be able to hold it together during this, so excuse my tears. Uh, Madison Belden came into our life six years ago. She had cystic fibrosis. When I met Maddie, she'd been in the hospital a solid year. Think about a solid year in the hospital. Maddie uh, wanted to come see our animals, but she couldn't get out of the hospital. So we snuck some animals into the um, garage of Texas Children's Hospital, and they wheeled her down, and she got to play with some of our animals for a few minutes, right? And uh, and she thought that was awesome. We kept in touch with her. One of my, one of the great wildlife artists of America, my friend Calvin Carter, she loved art. She loved wild, she loved Luna animals. He went and did private wildlife art lessons with her in Texas Children's Hospital. And then Maddie had no concept of time because she'd been in the hospital. She would call me and Lisa on FaceTime at 2 a.m. Hey, Mr. Chester, Miss Lisa, how y'all doing? And I'd be like, Maddie. She'd call Calvin in the middle of the night. Can you help me figure out how to put this brow on this animal, you know? But Maddie was something else. And um, toward, uh, I guess this was the early 2018, like February, she calls me one day and she goes, I want to do something to help wildlife. And uh, I'm like, baby, what do you want to do? She goes, I want to do some art you can hang up at your Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center and people can talk about wildlife and help. She was 16 years old. And I'm like, that's awesome. She goes, give me some animals. So I gave her like a list of animals that were pretty cool. And I said, pick something you like, you know? And so she picked ferrets. So we had ferrets, but she did black-footed ferret. She picked a bald eagle. And she drew ferrets and bald eagles. And then I saw her in early March. She came and brought, brought them to us and visited our animals. She was doing great. And then um, I get a call on a Friday night from her grandmother at like one o'clock in the morning. If you want to see Maddie, you need to come to the hospital this weekend. Something went really bad. So me and my, my wife, and we have a, me and my wife are big about mentoring. We have a young lady we call her spiritual daughter. We mentor in, as, as a follower of Christ. Her name is Demi. If you're on my social media, Demi's all over it. And Demi and I went into the room. Lisa 
My daughter was too young to go in, so me and Demi went in. And uh, Maddie was hooked up to everything. Life support couldn't talk. And so there's no training for this. You just go. And Demi starts singing hymns over her. And I just start talking to her and praying over her, let her know we love her. Because the ear is the last thing to go. And I look, I turn around, and the nurse is bawling. She'd have to pass. I go outside. The nurse says, sir, I've been watching her all week and every single vital sign that we watch is all over the map every 30 seconds. When you two walk into the room, every single vital sign she had went perfectly normal. I said, it isn't us. It's who we brought with us. I have to say my goodbye to Maddie. She passed away the next day. But I had her picture. And they hang there at the Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center. And I remember a little girl who wanted to use her valuable time to do something great for wildlife. And she did this art. And it lives on. And I can tell Maddie's story. But you know what this relationship component of this room is about happening in that room? I walked out of that room bawling. Her Life was challenging outside of the cystic fibrosis part too, and I was angry. And I go and I sit down and there's one kind of pleasant looking woman in the room that doesn't look like a scowl on her face. And I sit across from her and this woman tells me, I mean, tells a guy next to her, I hope Rihanna's sea turtle wish works out for make a wish because they can't find a sea turtle for us right now. If I'd have been there five seconds later, I'd have missed that conversation. And I said, uh, excuse me, you say make a wish in sea turtle? Yeah, my daughter has cystic fibrosis. She wants me to see a turtle. I said, hi, my name's Chester. We have a program called Wild Wishes, and I guarantee you, your daughter will meet a sea turtle. Six weeks later, she got to meet a sea turtle. But she calls me, and she says, Mr. Chester, is parental loss part of this Wild Wishes thing too? I said, yeah, well, my best friend Lauren just lost her daddy. She wants me to see a turtle too. I'm like, cool, I already got a sea turtle set up. She goes, but she wants to re release an injured rehab to sea turtle. I'm like, oh, let's up the challenge. Six weeks later, the Amos Research Keep in Port Aransas, the great people there, saved sea, two sea turtles. They kept them back an extra week so two girls could stand in the surf at Port Aransas, Texas and release injured at rehab green sea turtles into the Gulf of Mexico. That was because of a relationship. I had a relationship with Maddie. She had a relationship with Rihanna. Rihanna comes to us a few months later and said she wants, because of what happened, she wanted to change her life and dedicate it to wildlife conservation. She is now a senior at Texas Tech with the wildlife biology degree. Awesome young lady. It all began with relationships. It all began with speaking out. And all began with communicating this. We all have different levels and walks, but we're not all called to the same thing. We're all called to be good to people. And if you hunt, if you fish, whether you know it or not, you're called to help wildlife conservation. We won't have this thing. And here's the thing, it, the, the wonderful, beautiful silver lining is we're doing great things. The fact that this podcast summit has grown so much in here thanks to the vision of him has brought people together from all walks of life. Do you realize the media that's been created here is gonna go out and hundreds of thousands of people are gonna hear positive, wildlife conservation, pro-North American model, pro-hunting, pro-fishing information. It's astounding. So we all have a higher calling to seek in our life. We all have new memories to make. And I think what we can do is walk out the doors of this and let's go find the people out there struggling. Let's go find the people that have something deep in them that we might notice. Let's bring them with us on the next hunt. Let's bring them with us at the next event. Let's bring them with us and let's use our platforms to help others and help wildlife. God bless you guys and thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, this is Chester Moore. A few years ago, someone asked me a really interesting question at one of my wildlife presentations. Hey Chester, what's the most dangerous thing in the woods? And without blinking, I said, people. Kind of had a gasp in the room. But in reality, the most dangerous thing statistically in North America and probably globally in the woods, in the wildlands, is people. 
You got the level of a few hunters who shouldn't be in the woods because they're clueless and will shoot anything that moves. That's one level. You got maybe poachers you can run into. Then you get into things like criminal elements, meth labs, human trafficking. And then maybe the darkest level of that, serial killers. Now I know the mainstream wildlife media doesn't touch this. Heck, the media doesn't touch this. But at Dark Outdoors, we're gonna talk a lot about it. But not just the human element, because there are other dangers as well. Do you know that there is a massive shift in wildlife-human conflict? Not only talking about you know, grizzlies and mountain lions, even animals like moose and elk. As wildlife populations expand, and they are, and human populations expand, there is a clash out there, and we need to know. But not only that, climatic conditions are changing, and there are some bizarre weather conditions and things people are encountering. So at Dark Outdoors, we're gonna talk about things that maybe other people are afraid to talk about. Because our mission is to shine light into the dark outdoors and hopefully save some lives. And at the same time, talk about some really interesting stuff. So you can find more about this at darkoutdoors.com or check out Dark Outdoors, the podcast.